Good morning. I'm Malcolm Young, the Dean of Grace Cathedral here in San Francisco. Welcome to the Forum Winter Season. We are the recipients of an incredible gift, a photographic work by artist David LaChapelle entitled Our Lady of the Flowers. It was unveiled yesterday in the south transept of the cathedral, and it's hung beneath the 23rd Psalm stained glass window. David attended high school at North Carolina School of the Arts, where he originally enrolled as a painter. While there, he began experimenting with photography, hand painting his own negatives before processing his film to achieve a full spectrum of color. At age 17, Le Chappelle moved to New York City. Following his first photography show at Gallery 303, he was hired by Andy Warhol to work at Interview Magazine. In the decades since, David has become one of the most published photographers in the world. And his work has expanded into music video, film, and stage projects. He, his work is exhibited internationally in galleries and museums in London, Paris, Rome, Washington, DC, and New York, among many other cities around the world. Today, we're going to be talking about the story of Our Lady of the Flowers and his storied career. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. I, I was just saying this. David's um, about four time zones off from all of us, so. I can imagine doing the forum at like four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, you've uh, met and photographed so many different uh, famous people. I wonder if you can talk about the people who stood out the most in your memory, um, and is there something uh, about them that makes them you know, different than other people? Yeah, I would have to say, um, of course, the early, early shoots, you know, you, you, your first time photographing. Uh, my first celebrity was Eartha Kitt. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was wow. Pretty amazing. <laughs> and um, I was just a, I was 18, and uh, she asked me to. We did this for Soul Downtown Magazine, you know. And uh, it was funny because I I went back to those negatives when I was putting my last book together, and I wanted to use one of them. And I went through the negatives thinking I would be different, but I went for the same exact photo I chose. Oh, that's when great. When I was 18, and yeah. she was just great to work with. And um, afterwards invited me to come watch a recorder in this watch a record in the studio and I I went um, this winter and and um, and afterwards I she wanted me to walk her to the hotel and I was walking her through Times Square and a couple people recognized her and she was in this, all this fur and we got to the Carlisle Hotel and we we're walking up and she turned around and she goes I don't suppose you want to come up to my room and she, she looked up and down and said I didn't think so and she's like walked so that was my first I was like I love this life this is amazing um, this is like a, you know tell the story many years later yeah I just think it's amazing too you go back at the pictures and you choose the same one yeah and and um, so that was a really fun member and I really knew who she was because because I had worked in this playhouse and she performed one night and I brought my parents and so I was like all into her. Yeah. And then and then later, um, I think my one of the most pro profound experiences was Muhammad Ali. Because I grew oh, yeah. up, um, my father was a big fan of his, but I, I wasn't a boxing fan, but I later when I learned about his life and what he stood for and you know, to leave boxing at the height of his you know, powers as a, as a young athlete and just turn his back on all that money, never knowing if he could ever box again yeah. or who might come up underneath. You don't you have a crystal ball, you know? Mm -hmm. Just to have that much faith and you know, belief of like, you know, not gonna fight in this corrupt war and it's not against my religion. And that to me was so heroic, you know? And then, and then meeting him, I was so nervous, you know? And he was very funny because um, he could see I was really stressed out and, and he, it was, you know, he had, he had Parkinson's at the time, but he was still doing really well. He looked great, and I would turn around, and every time I turned around, he would start laughing because I was really kind of like short with my assistants and stuff. And it was a little, I was tense, you yeah. know? I was like, this is like Muhammad Ali. And normally I'm super relaxed, you know? But that morning I was like really, it's Muhammad Ali. And uh, every time I turned around, he kept laughing to get, like I was getting more film. And then I realized every time I turned around, he was going like this <laughs> like to me. <laughs> so my whole crew was thought that was the best thing ever. Because what he was doing was breaking nuts, and I yeah. saw him, and, I was, and then I started laughing, and then that just changed everything. Yeah. But he was so humble, and he, and he stayed, and he wanted to sign every single person. I mean, every crew member, every caterer, everyone who worked on this, you know, there's lots of people in the yeah. studio and stuff, and he just wanted to, you know, normally, you know, we have a rule like don't, Ask people for photos and and you know because right, they feel at home yeah. and 
And um, no, he wanted to sign it. He wanted to sign everybody's yeah. anything and yeah. pose every photo with them. And he would like, you know, put his boxing glove up. So I just saw like such humility in this giant. So all of that building himself up when he was a young man, he had to because he was going to go on to fight yeah. by himself. And he had to like psychologically get himself to the point of like, I'm invincible, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. <laughs> you know, but in real life, he was actually so humble. You know, I mean, I, I, it's funny because I think because we grew up in the same time, in the same setting, I mean, he was a her heroic figure for me too. I, yeah. I don't think I ever have remembered an athlete who, was, who, who took such principled stands mm -hmm. and who was so articulate about it and who seemed so articulate, he made it witty, fun. And funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But one of a kind. And exactly. I mean, talk, talk about somebody who suffered for the sake of his faith. I mean, it was just like he kind of burst never out of the. never knew what, what would happen. Yeah. He could have another box coming right underneath oh, him. Yeah. Never get his crown back, never get his license back the box but he stood by his principles and I just think that in this world today where everything's everybody's kind of fueled by greed it seems you know yeah. so much greed and just more and more and more and every you know just people I don't know it feels that way it feels like the world is kind of being ruled by this you know this greed the love of money is root to all evil you know it's not money itself it's the love of it right so you kind of feel like everywhere you look so many of these problems in the world are fueled by greed you yeah. know and to have this athlete just turn his back on them. And he, and he was living in a, you know, he, his friends turned their backs on him. And he was living in this tiny little apartment. Yeah. And he was the you know, heavyweight champion of the world. Right, right. So think about that. That's, yeah. that's a huge, that's a real hero. You know, I think it's great that you, you admire his humility. I mean, so oh, yeah. someone on our staff that has met you in the last five days mm -hmm. said you were our, she said you were the, our favorite one. Like of all the artists and all of so everybody who comes to Grace Cathedral, that you are the one who, who touched this person the most. Oh, and I, you know, it's so well, funny because so I never, nice until this moment, realized that connection. I mean, it's like, because you, you're taking people, pictures of people as they're connecting with you. Do you know what I mean? So you're you, you are part. Of, I mean, you're the you're kind of the mirror they're looking at when they're when they're um, giving you that image. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. That just that relation between the, a photographer and artist and and the subject. Right. I mean, sometimes you have a real close relationship, like Getcha, who's who's um, you know, in the Lady of Flowers. That's my friend Getcha, and we're like brother and sister. So we have a very close relationship and super relaxed with each other to the point where, you know, she'll complain all the, you know, and just, you know, and we'll fight or the, if you guys knew what was going on behind the scenes. And then afterwards we're all close and loving and, but, you know, laughing and whatever. But, you know, we have our moments, like fighting like cats and dogs, you know, but then, you know, it's just so many, every, every, every situation presents a different, you know, personality, some that you know, some that you don't know. And I've just found that having a really good crew around me, the best, the best crew and people who are kind, like people walk into the studio and they just feel the warmth and they feel they're not you know, being stared at by a bunch of people dressed in black, like, oh, what are they wearing? Right, and right. Think they're the star, they're the one that looks good. Everyone's there to kind of you know, make them feel at home. And, and uh, they're just genuinely really nice people that work um, at my studio. I'm glad you mentioned about the getcha too, because in a way, I mean, you know, on one hand, there is that element of the two of you can bicker with each other, mm -hmm. um, but it also means that you, she can open up in a way that she couldn't if it was me taking the photograph. And, and I do think that's an important part of Our Lady of the Flowers is that there is a sense of compassion. Right, and, and we share and, a, a really strong faith. Yeah. You know, she came from Haiti and she would pray every day with her grandmother for hours. And, you know, really was to get off the island of Haiti, and yeah. she managed to do it, you know, and, and have this life for herself, and really being an orphan, you know, now, you know, so we have a, a lot of faith, we pray together, we go to church, so we, we share that, you know, yeah. also, which I think really, the, that gives us the motivation for the bigger picture. I mean, never thinking it was going to wind up in Grace Cathedral. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was a three. It was three years it took, and John Byrne, you know, really was responsible for for because I was. They, they're not going to want that picture. They're going to look and see all the pictures I did with Little King back in the day. And they're going to be like, oh no, no, we can't have him in our church. And I was just, I really, you know. So having faith is great, but having people that have faith in you is 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 really great too. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, mean, I have faith in the people I work with, but they. 
they have more faith in me than I think sometimes I have in my. In you know, my I love world. when you talk about Getcha leaving Haiti. I mean, mm. you, know, it, it, you know, obviously your, your bio is like everywhere, um, but it's just like such a it's such a shallow. Uh, your, your experience of it is so much deeper. But you were really on, on your own too at a mm. really young age. I, I was, but you know, I my parents lived close Not by. Not that far. That's true. You know, that's they lived point. in Connecticut. And I didn't leave home because of them. Yeah. And in fact, there were amazing examples of what. You know, my dad was, he found God in, in the church, as we, we spoke of, you know, yeah. earlier my mom found God in nature. So I had this, like sort of two examples of, but they're both very humble people. Uh-huh. And even when my father became successful, you know, he just was, you know, talked to everyone the same. And he just kind of lived it. He didn't preach to us. And I, it wasn't pushed on me at all. I mean, he would pray with me at night, but but it wasn't like you have to go to church and that, that sort of thing. I just was drawn to, and I, I didn't realize how much of an effect it had on me until I came around 17 or 18, I was really started getting into um, ideas of like where the soul goes and what, what is it, you know, what does that look like? What does the soul look like? And try to, try to photograph the unphotographable yeah. in the East Village in New York and mystical things, you know, I, you know, spiritual questions, religious questions, and, you know, what would paradise look like? And, and, you know, that was a coming out of time when AIDS was hitting really hard, and I was, I was really young, and living in this utopia of the East Village, and suddenly this dark cloud came, and it was like this, this scary disease that, it was like COVID, but 100% fatal, Yeah. you know? And it only affected a certain group of people, yeah. you know, pretty much. And so there wasn't a lot of action done, and we joined ACT UP, and so being Grace Cathedral is so exceptionally like profound to have the picture here because of the history of this cathedral. And I love this story, and if you could just tell it to my friends, I've tried to say it, and I've watched it, about the, about the um, clergy who yeah. saw the young man crying, and I heard this, and I was like, I know this. Yeah, you know, it's I mean, so it, mystical that, that the pictures here in this church were St. Patrick's, we were protesting in ACT UP right. because they were really closing their doors. And you had Jerry Falwell at the time saying AIDS is God's punishment for being gay. And he was a very loud voice because there's only four channels on cable. Right. And the 700 Club was 24 hours. And it was like, <laughs> AIDS is God's punishment. And here are these people dying alone in shame. You know, young people, you know, some, back then, a lot of people were kicked out of their families and they didn't have the support. So here's Grace Cathedral on the West Coast, you know, in San Francisco. And this whole, all, it all started with this experience that one of the clergy had with a young man yeah. in, in upstairs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we, um, you know, uh, I think um, what I loved about what you said yesterday when you talked about it, you said um, Jerry Falwell was, said um, AIDS is punishment, and mm-hmm. he was wrong. I mean, was th- wrong. this is not what Jesus' teaching right. was. Jesus' teaching was... God loves every mm-hmm. person without exception. And yeah, so what happened? I, I saw through that. Yeah, but a lot of exactly. my friends did it and they hate Christianity and they, you know, they just, with a passion, you know, and it's, it's not, it's, they look at me like I'm crazy and people in the art world, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, it's not like Jesus in the jungle or Mary is not like a hot ticket at the gallery. Right. You know what I mean? I do. It's yeah, not. Yeah. So that's why I do my you know, commercial work to support this work, yeah, you know, yeah. to, to be able to make this work because, yes, I show it in exhibitions, but it doesn't mean that people are collecting it. Right. It, there's a lot of resistance right now. Yeah. You know, we see it in the empty churches, but this church is so exceptional, and that's why it was so, that story... Can you tell it? Yeah, yeah. Really well, so I mean, so our, um, so we, we, we were so alarmed, a clergy at Grace Cathedral, mm. that there would be people um, dying at San Francisco General Hospital mm. who were dying alone. I mean, mm-hmm. doctors and nurses were afraid to even care for them, mm-hmm. and so we said that no one should die alone. And so we established a chaplaincy, special chaplaincy for. San and that Francisco was because General. of that encounter. Yes, exactly. Can you, can can you talk about that? Encounter? Yeah. So I mean, there's a bunch of uh, the history of gay people at Grace Cathedral is just extraordinary. So one right. is, I mean, in in, in 19. Uh, 1968, mm-hmm. uh, uh, one of the um, readers got up to read the, the letter to the, um, the, the the epistle, the reading from the, uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, I think. And instead, he read a manifesto about how um, the society is is um, ostracizing and um, and mistreating um, gay people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a, a tremendously powerful um, statement, right? There. And there will be people here today. You'll be upstairs. Mm-hmm. who are here on that morning. 
they heard him. Wow. And the dean at the time um, was wow. let him speak. And you know, he kind of started to go on a little bit and says, oh, it's time to wrap this up, but you know, we'll have a chance to talk about this more. Um, but so even in the 1960s, you wow. know, this was a conversation here in the Diocese mm -hmm. of California and here at Grace Cathedral. And you know, even the labyrinth, I didn't tell you this yesterday, we were talking about the labyrinths, but um, Lauren Artress was the one, of, one of the people, she was the first woman who was a priest at Grace Cathedral because having priests in the Episcopal Church mm -hmm. only started in 1975. Oh, okay. And so she was the first one here. Wow. And she worked with people who had AIDS. Mm -hmm. And she, was, she, she gave everything of herself to this ministry until there was nothing left. Wow. And she, she needed to step back from it for a little mm -hmm. while. So she wanted to come up with a, 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 a religious practice that anyone could practice. You didn't have to believe something. You didn't mm -hmm. have to you know, have a creed. You didn't have to have special instructions or teaching. And that's where that mm -hmm. walking the labyrinth came from. Anywhere in the world that you see that labyrinth, it's connected to here at Grace Cathedral. Wow. And to the people who are wow. ministering to people who are dying of AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we, we have... Um, clergy on the staff who, who um, had AIDS, we have, uh, or have AIDS, we have um, uh, clergy in the diocese too. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, we're a, an, it's an extraordinary community. And mm -hmm. your, it, that image of the, Our Lady with the Flowers is part of that message to the world mm -hmm. that, that God loves everyone without mm -hmm. exception. Um, so, so, you know, it, it's a perfect marriage. I mean, this is the place where you 100% belong. And in your art, yeah, it, it I mean, is... I never thought it would happen to be in this place, but this is the perfect church to have my first you know, piece. You know, one of the things I, I haven't talked to you at all about, but I would love to ask. I mean, part of the problem is we've had been, been talking for the last, like, three days. <laughs> but, you know, I, I haven't talked to you about your mother. So yeah, I, I mentioned that I'm, I'm talking about a poet. Um, mm -hmm. The poet that I, I'm talking about lived in Lithuania, um, oh, which okay. is your mom's home. Yes. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about her culture, her life, and just how she influenced you, too. Yeah, she uh, was a very big influence. My mom was a refugee. She came, um, there was a war. She didn't talk a lot about uh, Lithuania and the Baltic. She lived in the Baltic Sea. Um, I heard a few stories, you know, I know, I know that, that um, they lived uh, sort of, it's not off the grid, they didn't have electricity. They lived in a, in a village that was very, very remote, and my grandfather was an ice fisherman. And, um, you know, they would bury the vegetables in the winter with straw. So she really was, like, going back, way back in time, you know. And when she was 19 um, or 20, she came over on the, one of the last uh, times on a, at the end of the war, towards the end of the war, on an on a American um, battleship that they filled the hall with refugees. It came in right before Ellis Island closed. It was, like, the year, year last year or the year before... Um, prior to it closing. So she got, her family got, got into America and she went sent to the tobacco fields in Connecticut and that's where she met my father like, after three days. And um, yeah, and um, she was an artist that, you know, had to work in factories, had to take care of us and, yeah. you know, work at convalescent hospital, whatever it was, plus uh, take care of us kids, which she did and we had a, my grandmother, her, my mom's side, also looking after us when, when she was at work. And, um, but she was an artist. Everything she did, she did art, super artistically. And I mean, really on the top, like Easter, we'd come downstairs and she'd, she'd painted all these beautiful, like, like Easter scenes of animals and like baby animals and flowers coming in. They were like really well done. And they're all in the windows and we'd come downstairs and it was like stained glass. You know, so she kind of wow. made magic like a, for the holidays, but it was homemade, you know, it was very, um, and very creative. Like we'd leave a carrot out for the Easter bunny. And then we'd, we'd in the morning we'd wake up and there's like little like powdered, I, I found out later it was powdered sugar. She made little footprints going to like, she nod on the carrot at like with like a little knife or something. We're like, oh, they were here. You know, so it's just all these really creative things. It was super creative, yeah. you know, that, um, and and she was uh, very much a perfectionist. How things were done, like if I mean, she, she was trying to master lasagna and went up for weeks. She made lasagna every night until she perfected it. And then we didn't see it again for, you know, <laughs> for a year. It. But when she made it, it was like the best lasagna. You know, it's funny because uh, you know one of the things you said in passing yesterday was, or the day before, you said that your whole life. 
I mean, even as a very young child, you knew you were an artist. Yeah. And I wanted to l know more about that. What, like, yeah, what I think it, it started, well, I always was drawing and painting when I was little. When I started school, it was a, it was a traumatic, and I didn't really follow along a lot with what was going on. So I just started, I was just drawing my book, and then I remember around um, um, fourth, fourth or fifth grade, just really not knowing what was going on with long division and stuff. So I was like, I'm going to be an artist. I'm not going to need any of this. And so I just, <laughs> so like, don't worry about it. You're going to be an artist. I'll just keep, I would just draw my books, yeah. you know. And then at 15, I dropped out because um, bullying and it was just like, you know, I just didn't fit in in the, in the public school system at all. So I went to New York. Yeah. Um, and it kind of like a truant that just became more of it. After you missed three times, it's three letter grades. I figured, well, yeah. I already Never get caught F, up. so yeah. why bother? Yeah. So we just go to, the train was really close to the school, so I take the train to New York, and I was a truant that just, you know, let it become not going to school at all. So it was kind of slowly at first, and then it was just sort of, I didn't, stopped going. Yeah. So I missed my sophomore and junior year. And then my senior year, I had this crazy, it was like a miracle, that, you know, we, I'd heard about the school in North Carolina, School of the Arts, and you didn't have to pay to go there. You just have to have, have good work, and they, it was kind of like you had to audition to get yeah, in. And my father came to collect me in the East Village after working in nightclubs, and I was still going to art classes and stuff. I was sneaking yeah. into the Art Students League and, and doing life drawing and things, but he he drove me down to the school, and I put my work out, and you know, I was starting to, by the time we drove down there, I really wanted to be at school. I wanted that structure, yeah. and it was, you know, Parents were worried. I mean, I, right. I drop out there. My dad was the first in his family to go to college. My mom being a, a refugee, you know, school was everything. Yeah. But they understood I was really different, yeah. you know, and that I had my own sort of, and and you know that I, I was good at drawing. Yeah. So anyway, I got into the school. And that's where I learned photography. But that, that school was incredible. It really, it changed my life. And people say, "What well, was your big break?" That was getting into that school. I remember the, the, the dean, he liked my, I could tell he liked my artwork, but then he got my report cards and I had to go in with my dad and each of the students went in with their parent, you know, into this room and then they came out happy or sad. I go, oh, here, <laughs> yeah, you're all nervous. And I go into this room with my dad and he opens up my report cards and my heart just sank because I knew it was just going to be like, yeah. you know, straight Fs yeah. on, you know, for t two years. And he just went, looked at it, and he was this really funny guy. He was like a total 70s dude, like tall with you know, the mustache and the, the, the aviator glasses. Like he was just <laughs> like, the, our dean was really cool. And he was just going through the papers, and he was like, You flunked tennis. And he kind of like smiled a little bit, and that's when I knew I got in. He was like, Out of all the things, you flunked tennis. <laughs> So who were the teachers you had? Uh, Dean, yeah. I mean, Clyde was the best. He he changed my life. Oh, you know, he great. let me come back in there. And we had a crazy intense relationship because, yeah, we had you know, a lot of feuding and stuff. But it was really, really great. You know, at the end of, um, I finally did get a diploma. Yeah. And I couldn't graduate because I didn't have enough credit, some of them. But my mom got to live long enough to see we got a doctorate from the school, and oh, I gave yeah. it, you know, coming down there and seeing all my old teachers and stuff. Was that's pretty, so cool. Really I just love incredible. that part. The honorary doctorate, that's what they're for. <laughs> you know, the, the, yeah. the, it's, you're completely right, just to fix something that was wrong And before. to, you know, give the commencement and address, and I just told everybody, like, it's not what, you, what you're going to get from the arts. Yeah. What, what can you give the world that we, the world needs to see? What's the world hungry for? Yeah. And that's what I kept my, my, my talk about with them, was like, what are you going to give? You know, and even if you can't make it, a lot of the school were dancers. I still love photographing oh, dancers. Yeah. And I knew they weren't gonna, all going to get into the companies that they yeah, thought they would. Right. And I said, so, but, but this training that you got at the school, you can apply to something else, yeah. even if your life takes a different direction. And they always say, like, bang on the door and don't ever stop. Just try to. Yeah. But sometimes you have to go down the hall and find another door that's open yeah. that still will lead you, you know. Uh, to a great place. Yeah, because yeah. I started in fine art. Yeah. And and I wasn't selling my pictures. People in the 80s weren't really collecting photography that much. Definitely not mine. Yeah. <laughs> and so I started, 
you know, I lucked out in Interview Magazine hired me. So yeah, that, tell, tell that us led about to the Andy world Warhol. Of, what was your experience of him? I mean, we've all seen. He him. gave me my first home yeah. in the magazine, so that was like my college. You know, right. being around, being in that environment, and seeing you know somebody work at that level, and, and just, what was he like? And I mean, what? Um, really funny, and 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 um, you know, just very kind, very generous, and 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 you know, just a, a really good guy. I mean, he. Um, he told me, just do whatever you want, just make everyone look good. <laughs> and and he would get a kick out of the outfits I was wearing because I would dress really crazy back then. I was like, you know, expressing myself through like my friends. Were, so what kind of crazy things did you wear? I would, my friends would make crazy clothes. And, yeah, yeah. You know, just designers and stuff. And it was just, you know, yellow and, and black striped like jumpsuit, <laughs> like new wave-ish, yeah, yeah. Um, new romantic, I don't know, there's a lot going on. Yeah, completely. It was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, at 19 you can pull it off, or 18, but yeah. So yeah. stuff I wouldn't wear today, necessarily. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so you got started, and um, and and then you know how how did that lead to your next steps in your in your in your? Um, well, that just kind of led the door to magazines, and I started working a lot. You know, I started shooting celebrities for them, and the Beastie Boys was my, one of my first assignments for them, and um, just they more and more and more, and, and I learned about you know deadlines and making deadlines, and so it was really like you know a great. Like my university, yeah, of, of getting published in photography, and back then magazines were really important. Which Paper. the whole world's changed now, yeah. and you know, magazines are not what's really important anymore. Yeah. For us, you know, being a photographer, people don't look at magazines anymore. So, they asked me to do a master class early on when that wow. series first started, and I said I really can't for two reasons. One was that I really wouldn't know what to tell a young photographer how to get started, and I think yeah. that's an important thing. I think that's why a lot of people would pay for that masterclass. And the second reason was because I couldn't talk about my process, which is a lot of it involved praying and you know yeah. and and meditating and praying and asking God for direction on you know and praying before shoots, whether they're just secular shoots or or the the more ones that we're doing now, which are really centered on on very like the holy family basically and celebrating the holy family yeah. honoring the holy family so there'll be a lot of prayer going on and if i could, can't talk because you can't really charge money and then talk tell people oh i prayed before a shoot <laughs> like i want my money back uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so i was like i can't if i can't talk about that that's omitting something that's a really because everyone wants to know about process like oh that's a part of my process because honestly sometimes i just step out of the way and things just unfold, and, you're, and it really is. You think everything's so planned and something, especially photography that I do, because it's not, you know, I'm not reportage. It's right. everything's set up. I set up these tableaus, and everything's posed, and there's props and all these things. But you would be surprised, like, how many things just happen, like, without my controlling it. Like, they'll just fall into place. It's really something else, yeah. you know? And that's when I kind of just step out of the way and, like, you do feel like a channel that you're like letting God work through you sometimes. You know, yeah. and really, you, and those are the best pictures. Yeah, those are the ones that are like, wow, this came. I mean, yeah. and you really didn't feel like you just felt like. So many times I'll learn what the picture is about after I took it. I'm like, oh, and that, you know, in this photo, I remember we did. We're doing the Annunciation, and there's always usually a book, and there's a book near her because it's sort of in all the historical paintings. Right. And I just put this book in because I just felt it, you know, but my friend's like, how did you know that they always put a book in the, the yeah, painting right. next to me? I'm like, I didn't yeah. know that. I just, had, just felt like she right. needed a Intuition. book. Intuition. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a, a, like being guided and it's really amazing. So, yeah, that's definitely part of the process. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the most interesting things when you talk about that, I mean, I, I was t talking about this to um, our, our daughter uh, about your career. And I, I think there was a sense that I had, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, that there was this normal way that you go through. But, you know, technology changes everything so mm -hmm. substantially that, I mean, the way that you went through your career, it, it, it'll never be done that way ever again. Mm -hmm. um, because you had to be our age uh, mm -hmm. in order to have the experience we had in the 70s. 
a cable television didn't exist when we were young children, but mm -hmm. it did exist when we were um, coming into high school. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the video revolution, MTV, uh, you know, the, 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 the beginning the of internet, digital. And the internet. That social media. Kind of digital photography. And did magazines. Yeah, magazines, totally. Like, who would ever imagine that, I mean, it, it's hard to even describe to our children just how important magazines were. It's so important. Yeah. You know, you go by the magazine stands and just want to see what was going on yeah. in the world, whether it was pop culture or just, you know, like the, the photo magazines, like Life and Look, growing up with those. Oh, I remember yeah. might have seen Woodstock, because Woodstock, my parents' Life magazine. Like, I want to be there yeah. with the older kids. <laughs> like, like yeah. I was like five or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They're in the mud, can... naked. I want to go there. <laughs> I know, really. That looks like You're fun. They're in the mud, <laughs> naked. <laughs> How come really I can't be there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. And those images, are, I mean, just the image of Neil Armstrong on the moon, the, the, mm. the first image of the, the moon rise over the, the sun, the, the earth planet rise mm. over. The, I mean, there's so many, there's like these iconic images, and it just doesn't quite exist like that anymore. And right. I wonder if you can talk about what it was like, you know, uh, kind of moving from still photography into video, uh, magazines, just, just what. You know. I, well, you know, that was kind of a natural progression working. I wanted to, I love music, and so working for music videos, and then I did this documentary called Rise on this uh, dance phenomenon that was happening in Los Angeles called Crumping, but was also about the neighborhood and an alternative to gangs, and there was a big you know, church element to it too, because a lot of these kids made their own families and had church families, oh, and yeah. so, so how that church, the, the black church in South Central is really whole, is sort of the infrastructure of the neighborhood. You know, so that was an important story to tell. It wasn't just about dance. Dance was a release, but it did uh, inspire, like, like, Step Up and all that whole series came from, from, oh, yeah. from, from Rise. And Rise, um, you know, that was sort of a turning point in my life. After that, I found the place in Hawaii, and I really wanted to go back to starting, you know, to... to well, first, I was going to just stop photography, and I went to Maui, about this old nudist colony, and then... You know, I really felt I had some more pictures in me. Yeah. And about six months into it, I was like, gosh, I really do feel like I want to have some more pictures. And we got this call from a gallery, what I show in Germany, and they had a budget for me to make new pictures. So I was like, yeah. And that's when I did the Deluge series. And, and um, this series called Awaken, and it was sort of, um, well, the Deluge was from the Sistine Chapel, yeah. from the, the scene of Noah but in modern times, and I said it in Las Vegas, and it was a very kind of epic mural, yeah. you'll see at the exhibitions. But that really started me back to where I first started, which was in galleries. My first shows were in galleries in New York in my friend's apartment and some little downtown galleries, which led to magazines. So then coming back full circle, um, I'm so happy I had that experience because, you know, it brings so much to the to the new pictures that I'm doing. They're very connected to the pictures I was doing in the '80s, yeah. and there's a it's like a full circle. Also, in the sense that you know, at, at the exhibitions, a lot of kids are coming. It, bring, it brings in tons of young people to these exhibitions. And my other friends who are artists, like, gosh, you got so many young people coming to your shows, and because they're there to you know for Travis Scott or Dua Lipa or Lady Gaga or whoever, and they'll come in and they may see some of those pictures, they'll be somewhere, you know, but they'll be represented in a very much smaller way. And what they will see is a lot of the, you know, the newer pictures from the last 15 years. Yeah. And which is mostly, mostly very, you know, um, much on the path that I'm in now, which is really trying to, you know, bring just, just as much light and kind of be the, you know, antidote to what I see happening in, in popular culture right now, you know, and, and to me that is all, sometimes beauty and really great things inspire you and, and, and also simultaneously negative things can inspire you or bad things can inspire you. When I see what's being offered on Netflix and there's, you know, there are, there are five separate offerings on Ted Bundy, for instance, right, the serial right. killer, yeah. but not one on Stevie Wonder. Yeah. You know, one of the greatest living artists of all time, a right. prophet of music, and one more Grammys than anyone else for best album. We don't have a documentary on him, but we have five on Ted, five different, you know, drama series. So what is this obsession with murder? You know, it's in the Bible. It's like we're right. not supposed to be obsessed with this stuff or look at it. Yeah. It's not something we're supposed to be taking in. And um, I see that, and it just makes me want 
you know, th- if popular culture is a reflection, you know, or, 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 co- or if art is a reflection on contemporary society, so art or history is really art history too. Yeah. When people study history, they're looking at the art, they're looking at the architecture and how the people live, and they put putting the puzzle pieces together, the anthropologists. So we study a culture and what they valued through their art. What was important to them is through their art. Yeah. So it's reflected in their art and their belief systems. And, and if we look at around today, what people are really looking at, it's not necessarily the museums, it's, it's, it's really what they're watching on Netflix yeah. and what they're, you know, those type of things they're watching. Yeah. So I, much I of it is. You're so right, I mean, the things I see are just horrifying. And you're right, I mean, Netflix has a, a, like a reach that like <laughs> Time Magazine had in like the 50s. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, it is the, the way. It, things we, being made. Yeah. That, 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 the people there's are not really an alternative, that's the, the the thing where you look in, in music and I mean it, you go back very very briefly and there was so many genres there were so many genres of rock they had categories of rock yeah. there's not a rock band or an alternative band or folk music you know the people who were singing of things that were a little bit deeper or you had Stevie Wonder and Prince and artists yeah. that were bringing something to the world even you know as recent as Prince and yeah. we just it's gotten very narrow yeah. that the sort of popular culture. And, and yet, of course, it's always going to be the band, but I'm talking about like sort of zeitgeist bands yeah. you know, that were like the Beatles bringing us Let Us Be, Let It Be, or, you know, there was a time in, in music where there wasn't Christian rock and secular music. It was all mixed together. Yeah. So you had, you had um, uh, Jesus Is Just All Right With Me by the Doobie Brothers. You had Spirit in the Sky, which was yeah. number one. You had Let It Be. You know, you had so much music that was, was okay talking about God or Jesus, and now that would be yeah, taboo. Yeah, you so much, exactly. Really, well, like, in a way, it's again connected to all this te- change of technology. And that, yeah. that we, we used to have radio stations that we were all listening to, mm-hmm. and now we can listen to finer. But you know, one of the traditions we have on the forum, I forgot to tell you about this, is that we take questions from from the audience. Okay. So um, Rebecca Nessa will, will um, assemble their questions and bring them to me. Um, you know, you know uh, one of the things I keep thinking about because I've seen you get photographed now, but. Like, 50 times because everybody wants to take your picture. Um, when people, when um, you, do you have any advice to ordinary people who are taking pictures? Like how to make our pictures <laughs> a little bit nicer? I mean, <laughs> selfies, I'm really, I have no advice Maybe not at selfies, all. but I mean, even Use just, a flash. We're all, use a flash. <laughs> use yeah. a flash. That was, that's good advice. After, good advice. after a certain age, flash is great. Yeah. You know what I mean? That is good advice. Like, yeah. Yeah, completely. Even outside, full flash. Yeah. Full flash, exactly. <laughs> and you know, it's so funny in photography, it, you know, going all the way back, you can talk to your, you know, your family albums and stuff, and you'll show like a, the family photo, and it's like the last photo ever of Aunt Mary or something, and people will just look at the photo and be like, do I have a double chin? Before, like, they'll look at Aunt Mary, and they're just like, how do I look? You know, like, they all go, yeah, everybody right. wants to look good. It's kind yeah. of a human thing, you know, and I think the Andy was right. Like, do whatever you want, just make everyone look good. Yeah. You know? I, I like that. <laughs> In a way, I mean, that's a good, like, uh, there's good lessons for life. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the, where the inspiration for Our Lady of Flowers comes from, because this will, will be archived. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at Grace Cathedral, we have so much art that speaks to me so deeply, mm-hmm. and I know so little about the artists. I mean, that's part of the, the joy of having you be here to be able to talk a little bit about it. So maybe you can describe the picture and then um, talk uh, about sure. how it came into being. Well, I was doing a lot of pictures. We did the Annunciation with Getcha. Um, around that time, maybe maybe a few months earlier. And I, I was really loved Getcha's face. She has a kind of a Russian icon, like face that and she relaxes her eyes and she just, to me, looks like one of those Russian icons on the altar. And yeah, she was there, you know, kind of staying in Maui, so she was, you know, like handy because she yeah. was right there. So it's really the people around me, I'm always putting them in photographs, especially friends. And I had been um, getting more into this. I didn't know that much about Mary. And I started, and I learned the rosary. I was starting to do the rosary every once in a while. And I'm really feeling something when I did it and really trying to focus on the words and the, you know, doing it outside in nature, um, in gardens and stuff. And I think I love that the female representation in, in you know, the idea of the, the Holy Family or, or just in religion in general, having the sort of, Intercessory, where you don't, you know, um, 
worship her in the sense, but you, she's sort of someone you can pray to that can help like the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, it's just, for me, it's, a, it's really nice to have that female representation, the, the mother. Yeah. You know, and the Pieta has been a, a theme in a lot of my pictures, and that was, you know, the, the symbol of greatest loss is a mother losing a child. Yeah. Um, and just wanting to do this beautiful photo, because I know, you know, I, I love the story of... Um, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Um, I love the the, uh, um, the. What's the other one? Was she appeared in Italy? Um, uh, yeah, Lord. It, it, was it Lord? Uh, Lady's Lord, yeah. Was she in France? In France. Yeah. And no, then there's one in Italy with little children. Which one? Fatima. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. It's Portugal. It's Portugal. In Portugal, Fatima. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I love these stories of apparitions in, in, because in, I. I kind of didn't know what to think of all that when I was growing up and, and stuff. And then I had a sort of a strange experience myself. And I was like, wow. I was with a friend, too, someone I work with. And we both saw it. I was like, OK. And I know that you know, that only happens in, in very humble places yeah. in the world, like apparitions and, and visitations. So you had things. that kind of experience as a child, like as a young person. Uh, and actually, more recently than that, yeah, as an adult. and. Um, I knew, and I was with a friend, and it was just something that I think we needed something that time to show us we were on the right track, that we were doing the right thing, and, and it, it happened, and it was, it was, I couldn't even sleep that night, yeah. you know, it was, it was you know, for weeks, I was just, you know, so then I started thinking, you know, when, when there's these appearances or very mystical things happening around the world, it's always in countries like the Philippines or, or Guadalajara or places where people have just really strong faith, but are going through a very, very tough time, you know, either with a famine or with some sort of lack, you know, yeah. and they're very humble people. And, you know, they're, he's not, you're not having apparitions of Mary or Jesus in sort of, you know, affluent places. I mean, Jesus never slept in a city. He would always leave the city to, yeah. to sleep outside in the gardens at night or in the olive trees and, or wherever. He wouldn't stay overnight in the city. And sometimes in cities, people are so sophisticated and there's a lot of scoffers. Yeah. People that will be like, oh, that's not an apparition. That's a reflection of light off that thing. And yeah, that may be the physical cause of right. it. You know, but that, doesn't, that, that also doesn't take away the fact that it is an apparition. You know, if it's a, if the face of Jesus maybe is a rust stain or something, people will scoff at it like, oh, those hillbillies down there seeing yeah. Jesus in the rust stain. Well, maybe those people needed to see that. Yeah. You know, and maybe that, you know, so we don't know. You know, and I think I to have an open wonder, mind about this. How does it feel for you? Because people are going to have that experience of um, Our Lady of the Flowers. They, that, they, they're going to have those kinds of experiences here at the cathedral. So, well, I, you know, I know that I know that there's a, a, a power in art, and I, I would really hope that that would affect someone, yeah. you know, and, and people visiting the, the the cathedral. And you know, you can't, of course, you can't expect it to happen for everyone, but just if it would happen to anyone, it'd be a great thing. Yeah, you know, yeah just exactly. Have it here is is um, yeah, I've been, it's pretty amazing, you know. Yeah. I was just actually reading your, the, the letter that you first sent us about, about this. Can I read just a section from this? Sure. <laughs> so this is like the, almost like um, the, this is what David um, wrote for, for us. Um, As a young photographer, I grew up during the AIDS epidemic, and my early work was deeply influenced by ideas of life, death, and the metaphysical. Since then, I've maintained a strong connection to God and believe it has not only kept me alive, but given me direction in my work and life. I try to listen to God's direction in my work and purpose as an artist. As I've matured, I understand the need to be vigilant in my purpose, which is to make imagery that brings light to the world, especially in a time when there is so much confusion and darkness. And it's, it must have power on for you even now to hear those words. That you heard. <laughs> yeah. It was the beginning of a great, a great friendship. OK, so here is a, um, here is a question. Um, you are only 60, lots to go. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what yeah, is your that's, hard, that's funny hearing that. Yeah, well, for the I mean, first time. Well, I mean, it's good to be reminded that. that we have, we what have, happened last night? Okay, good. We have so many. People, yesterday, I have so many friends in their nineties, and they're like, "Oh, if I was in my, if I was only in my fifties again." <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, so um, she said, um, "So you have a lot to go. Um, what is your frontier? Where are you going next, artistically or otherwise?" Well, uh, thank you for the question. I'm. 
I'm making a, a series this week. We're starting, um, and it was a lot of praying when it just put a Stations of the Cross. We're photographing this week, and it that was incredible too. To talk about getting out of the way. I was very confused as whether I was to do this or not. And I was out in Maui, and I was alone a lot. And I kept thinking I really want to do Stations of the Cross, but I didn't know if it was my idea or just something I was, you know, because. You know, and I, so one night I, I, and I was having a lot of roadblocks, and I was looking for the right person to do it. And first, I was going to put a lot of different people to portraying Christ, and then that was a bad idea because I thought that would look like I was just trying to be woke or something, and I didn't want to do that. And so I just said, okay, let me just find someone who looks like they're from the Middle East. And then this person didn't work out, so I was just thinking, maybe I'm not supposed to do this because it's not flowing at all, you know. And I'm having a really difficult time doing it, so I prayed. And I was just asking God, like, really, keep, please help me know if I'm, I'm, if I'm meant to do this or not. And I woke up the next morning at 6 a.m. and it was, it was like there was this Italian rapper that had wanted me to do a, an album cover. And I'm just, you know, I heard about it. I just thought, oh, Italian rapper, they're gonna have tattoos all over the place because Italians have more tattoos than any other country in the world per oh. capita. And, I was, and, they all, and all the, the rappers are really trying to extra to be like American rappers, yeah, so there's yeah. more gold and there's more tattoos and it's more like, you know, violent and crazy. And I just thought, I'm, this is, you know, I wasn't really thinking about this guy at all, yeah. you know, this project that was being offered up. And But I woke up in the morning, like 6 a.m., kind of woke up with this thought, like the Italian rapper. And I'm like, Italian rapper. So I went up, I was sitting in my cabin, I went up and I called my, my agent and I said, what's the guy's name, the Italian rapper? And I looked him up and, I've been searching for a Christ face, you yeah. know, that, that really had empathetic eyes. Yes. It was really about the eyes, you know, because we could fix the hair and the beard and everything. But I just needed those eyes that look very merciful and poetic and loving and forgiving. Yeah. That has to come through the eyes. So when I saw, I looked at him, he has no tattoos and he had this long hair and these incredibly profound, like, they call him the poet. Wow. That's his nickname in Italy. Yeah. And here he was, like, coming in. And all the time I was praying about earlier, I have this, like, still small voice saying, it's coming to you. You don't have to struggle with this. You don't have to struggle. Because I was really trying to, but I was really yeah. struggling. You know, I was like, I got I to gotta get the right guy. And why haven't you found him? Have you put this thing? I was calling Los Angeles and talking to the studio, like, you got to put a casting out on this. got to be in the, all this street and just have to find the right person. And, you know, just getting kind of anxious about it and stuff. And then I just let go. And then... He was already there. He was coming to me. Yeah, wow. And so I, I got him on, I had him on a Zoom call like two hours later at 8 a.m. And he's in Italy and, I, and we talked about it as an album. He wants to do um, the Divine Comedy. Wow. But he doesn't want to depict how like in the gross, yeah, you right, know, exactly. like sequins, yeah. burn, you know, like red sequins, you know, none of that. He just, he just set, thought of it as isolation which is how I think of hell as like isolation, separation from God for eternity. Yeah. You know, so knowing that you could have been in touch with them, okay, losing that. So yeah. this idea of like isolation is would be hell and then heaven is gonna be shot in Maui and then purgatory is sort of kind of William Blake set that we're building. I talked to him about, about, about some of those ideas that we're just for, formulating. And then I said, can I talk to you in a few days about this other project I might have that yeah. you might be good for? So two days later, we had another call. And I said, yeah, I'd love to put you in our project. And um, he said, oh, I'd be so honored. And I was like, this is the perfect person because yeah. he's excited to do it. He's a performer. Yeah. And he just looks, you know, you look at his picture and it really comes through. And they call him the poet. And oh, he's even got the long hair. It was really oh, nice. I love yeah. it. I, and it just fell like yeah, that. But I, I woke up with a thought. Yeah. And it well, that's wasn't, what happened with me. That, that Thoreau book. I mean, that came I, 3 o'clock in the morning. I woke up. I'm like, I'm going to study Thoreau and I'm going to write a book about it. I and woke up at that, 3 o'clock. Was, was that uh, something that was gestating in your was mind or was like, that something there, that was a sort of there's like, like 50 different projects I could have done and so I this one just woke you up so yeah. for me that, I feel that sort of divine inspiration yeah well here's our next question two part question oh yeah I'd love to ask about this who was your most and least favorite person to photograph oh that wasn't quite what I was going to ask but it's a <laughs> good one <laughs> Yeah, I guess the most favorite was um, so there's something to learn from everybody from the bad experiences. <laughs> um, I guess at least the kind of the worst experience because there was so much expectation, and my studio manager was so in love with her at the time in the in the 90s. 
you know, we kind of grew up with Madonna, and that was sort of about, you know, photographing her was always a bad experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a, it was just tense and stressful for everybody. Yeah. It just made everybody feel bad. Yeah. You know, you know kind of just. I can imagine. Even I mean, her, her, her team, they were so stressed out yeah. and, on, and tense, and the shoots were so tense, and there was just no joy in it at all. Yeah. My like, gosh, if you're having such a bad time doing it, what's the point of yeah. being, a, being a, you know, Well, I can also imagine, rock. too, the times, too. I mean, the, the two of you were at like, were so much in the public eye, and I can imagine that, you know, making things worse, too. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, well, we, they asked the question, normally I wouldn't talk about it, but I'm yeah, at church. Yeah, completely. Little, That's a great answer. <laughs> so how about the, 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 how about the <laughs> best? It, well, like I said, yeah, Muhammad, my Muhammad, I think, there's, there's been so many, you know, yeah. been really good relationships with people. Um, Butterfield and John has been really fun, because it's been like 20 something oh, yeah, years right. now working with him. Um, so a lot, a lot of, you know, each one has their own little idiosyncrasies yeah. and characteristics and stuff, but... Yeah, we have a, I think the variety is also what makes it really, yeah. really fun to photograph different types of people. You know, and then, and so just, everyone's a star, you know, treating everybody the same, you know? Right, right, exactly. Everybody's a child of God. Um, before computers and digital, how did you construct your photos? Oh, um, the same way I do now. I mean, it's, there, I think analog, I grew up in analog, I grew up printing and um, processing my own film. And spending six years in the black and white lab, printing all my photographs, and six years in color, so 12 years. And so it's either in a dark room, a, a photo studio, or a nightclub. So they're called the dark ages of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's having a lot of fun, though. In Sounds East Village. fun. Yeah, it was oh. fun. But I spent a lot of time printing. And so um, my analog photographs, you can't tell that are next to the digital ones. Um, the di digital is... Just, um, much better way to work for the environmentally, just for a lot of reasons. You can, you don't have to process all those chemicals. And this so, person has so. other questions. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, it says, um, do you have a religious upbringing, and what inspires your religious themed religious themed world? Um, yeah, definitely. You know, my dad didn't force us to go to church, either, but I, I would go um, even as I got older. So everybody, I was I was the youngest, so I'd come home and my mom. You know, she didn't go, so I would go to church with my dad still, yeah. you know. So I had, um, I had Sunday school for a while, but like I said, it was it never really pushed on us that much, but I think it was just that door was opened and it was something that I, I gravitated towards. Yeah. So here's another question. Do you have thoughts to share about Richard Avedon and his work? Oh, I love Richard Avedon. My first book ever was um, a photo book. Before I ever thought I was going to be a photographer, I begged my dad to, helped me get this, I was like 11 years old or something, it was 1947, oh. um, 77, I really wanted this book, and it was at the mall for half price, and my dad got it for me, and I just poured over this book oh. all the time, and yeah. I think, you know, having a book is so different from some from social media, because, so Avedon put every single one of those, he chose all the photos, put them in the order he wanted, like, this was his masterwork in every decision, all his compositions. So it was the best of the best, the best hair and makeup people, the best styling, the best compositions, the best, you know, the way he would get people interacting and flying through the air. And it was different from, from the others. It was just something else deeper going on with his photographs. Yeah. And I just think pouring over this book so much, I really knew from a young age, like, sort of uh, what... Like what was a you know if I couldn't get the best hair makeup on a, a celebrity I would just like let's just do no makeup at all and it would, that would work yeah you know what I mean and, right. and wet hair if I couldn't get in a, right. and that when you're starting out you have to think about stuff like that because you know doing celebrities like a bad hair and makeup can really ruin the photo oh, forever yeah, totally you know well I, mean? I love the idea too that you you had this idea of what was really good available to you mm -hmm. like little did your father know I mean he was giving you. Like, well, I, I begged him for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like, little did he know. Please. I mean, even, I didn't know I was going to be a photographer. Yeah. I was just Neither so attracted. Neither did. But I mean, it was. I like thought it was really mathematical door. and scientific. Yeah, so I, was, I, can I was scared that. of it. Yeah. At first, and I realized it was so intuitive photography. Yeah. Even the dark room. So this is um, the other person's the other question. This person asked: Does to this day, does sketching, drawing, and painting ever um, free you for your photography? You know, it's funny. I was telling um, a friend of mine, Johnny, who. 
was a, such a big part in getting this. This, um, and I want to thank Johnny for it. Really, was Johnny's work getting getting this photo here. Yeah. And um, so, thank you, Johnny. I mean, we, I have a great team. With Johnny, was like spearheaded the whole Grace Cathedral. We're gonna yeah. do this. I'm like, I don't think they want. It. They want it. It's gonna happen. Don't worry. <laughs> but. Um, and by um, the way, I wanted it really badly. Oh, okay. <laughs> good. Um, yeah, now I forgot the question. So the question is, does um, uh, writing and drawing painting? Oh, right. Yeah, so I was telling Johnny the other two, like, you know, you get, when I started taking photographs in School of the Arts, I remember never finishing a drawing. And I drew, I drew and painted obsessively since I was little. And when I took my first roll of film midway through the year, we had a photography class, it was it for me. I mean, my, the first roll of film was, you know, Triax, 36 frames, yeah. at frame 17 or 18. Everything up until the first part of the, the contact sheet is like, you know, stairs with a, a shadow on, like really typical high school, a crack in the wall, like just, you know, super bad. Yeah. And then and then I had all my friends in my dorm room kind of undressed in sort of these Renaissance poses, like yes. all the dancers, right. like in the like One's Dying Slave, doing all these Michelangelo poses. Yeah. And I was like, this is it. That was my first day with a camera, you know, and and then printing those pictures. And that that was it for me. Like the adrenaline of a shoot was so exciting that going back to drawing now, it's like, I, I just don't, you know, you, there's, there's not, it's like hard to, it's really hard for me. I, I'll do thumbnails and, yeah. and I'll do thumbnail sketches and stuff, but it's really hard to paint again because I'm so used to that buildup of adrenaline and excitement, you know, that, yeah. that that's what I want to like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get excited about this drawing. Right, but right. But it used to be everything for me. Yeah. But I remember never finishing a drawing after picking up a camera. Yeah. Yeah, so um, this person um, writes about drawing as praying. Mm. Um, art photography. How do you make it more accessible to all art galleries? Uh, out of, it, can, it, it can be out of reach for many, yet there's so many stories to tell about this project. I can't read it quite because the handwriting's not great. Um, so how do you make it more accessible? Well, I think... Yeah. I think having it and you know having your work in, in a place like Grace Cathedral makes it more accessible than just having it exclusive in galleries or museums and, and, and things like that. So this is really an incredible you know gift and to be able to have my picture here oh, yeah. at a you know, place that's not you know that people come for many different reasons, not just to see to see art or to pay to get into see art. You know, so this is this is really wonderful. This is a perfect example of of getting pictures into a place that is accessible. Yeah, it really is. You know, I wonder if you can talk, I mean, just as you look back on your whole history of your whole art career, if you see different stages that you went through, or, mm -hmm. um, and I wonder too, if there's, are there particular pieces of art that you've created that, um, that, that, that have had a lasting influence in just how you see the world in particular? You know, one things that you especially remember. I, I remember the, when the Angel series I did um, when I was 18 and my, you know, I had, taught me a lot about having, you know, uh, investing in myself as, as an artist and had $2,000 in the bank and I needed to get these angel wings made. It was really a calling, like I had to get these wings made. Yeah. It took me two years to find the person to do it in New York and I had this money saved up. It was all I had in the world. And I found this, this, this prop maker and I said, the wings have to have muscles. And I had, I had designed them so they went down the back because this is analog. You know? right, so there was no right. digital getting rid of stuff. So that's why my work is still very much analog today because I think analog. So I, I set up all the tableau so you don't really tell the difference between the old and the new because yeah. I was always doing things that were sort of the unphotographable. Yeah. So I designed these wings and they had muscles and they looked like they could lift the person off the ground and the, wow. the feathers all had to be going in the right direction. So I was explaining this to this prop maker and I needed four sets. And then the wires went down the back. It was copper tubing. And then it was a weightlifter's belt that held oh, it up. Yeah, and I put right. a loincloth over it. So they looked like they were just coming off the person's shoulders. And they were big enough to lift them off the ground. I mean, they were really had muscle. And, yeah. and then there were just these beautiful white wings. He made me four pair. And he wanted 2,500 and I had 2,000. So I gave him that. And he said, OK. And I got my wings. And that was a really important series. And 
it has given back so much and still being you know exhibited today and shown me that you know don't be afraid to you know yeah spend whatever you need to spend or make, you know, the, whether it's time or money to, to make exactly how you want it. And it's right to, to do, to try to express the inexpressible, that the life of the spirit mm -hmm. calls us each individually to mm -hmm. try to, to, to um, put something beautiful in the mm -hmm. world about that experience of being God's child. Yeah, and, and just that, you know, putting the care into things and how, how they look and sort of honoring, you know, especially with, the, with these works, you know, we wanted to, to really to honor God and, and you know me, me and Glenn, who's here um, from Los Angeles, there he is. Um, we worked. We were looking at the picture yesterday, like oh, well, like we never thought it would wind up in you know Grace yeah. Cathedral, and we were looking. We went back and forth on burning in the sky, like the, the right, blue on the sky, right. like how far, how dense it should be or not. And these we went through so many work prints to really get that right color balance and. And we're like, it was worth it, look. <laughs> you know, it was like all that. You know, sometimes yeah. you're doing it, you're like, is someone gonna see, notice this? And then, you know, you, you just, you know, get these little fleeting doubts, but it, you know, it always pays off. It's always, you know, putting that extra into anything, it's, it's always worthwhile. Yeah. You know, um, I, it's, I, I can, I'm so sad because this is like our last, our last time together. Um, uh, the, the interview just went by so quickly, uh, <laughs> and I still have like I have fifty more questions to ask you. Um, but uh, we're wrapping things up, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about signs of hope that you see um, going forward. Um, just well, you know, I think we have to look at our at our at our own lives. You know, that that's where we find the signs of hope, yeah. which are inside of us, and it's sort of, you know. Things may look a certain way out in the world, but we walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. So having that in your heart, knowing that things may look this way and look bad and wars may seem to be brewing over here or over there, um, or the economy or whatever, those are those are the way things look. But what you know, we again we walk with our faith. Yeah. You know, and, and in our own lives we'll have we'll have signs, we'll have, you know, those signs of hope and encouragement that we we if we ask for those just God give just give me a sign of hope for you know whenever you whenever you want just give me the you know yeah. sign of hope and a lot of that is is within us already you know and it'll just come to the surface like you'll wake up with the inspiration to 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 write that book or I'll get that sign of of encouragement and hope about okay this this time rapidly just is going to be per perfect right, you know yeah. hopefully for this for this project coming up. But I do feel that it will be. I have this feeling of like, this is, you know, as soon as I prayed and got out of the way, I, I just had my answer, you know? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's, I, I guess that's what I would say. So the world can look, can look dark and, and confusing and, uh, you know, just what we, we have to be mindful of what we look at, what we take in, what, what, what we think of as entertainment. We have to be careful about, about those type of things because they do affect us or too much watching the news can affect us. And you know, um, and actually picking up the Bible ourselves and, and reading it because it will speak differently to, to, yeah, to each of us. That's why they call it living Bible. So what, what might be interpreted by some, one person one way, it will mean something else to us because this word reminds us of something, and then that's why it's alive, and we, we can pick up the Bible and, and get so much out of it. Yeah, that's why I loved your day. title, The Good News for Modern Man, because that was the <laughs> title of the yeah. translation that was most influenced our generation, because it mm -hmm. came in the 70s. Yeah, and, I had a copy but, of you know, that. I'll tell you. My first gallery Yeah, same with me. That's what people gave. You need, I mean, it was what you gave kids in the 70s. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. i got to say, you know, um, David, you, you are such a light to me. I'm so grateful for your work, um, oh. for, your, for your, your, your love of humanity, for your desire oh. to, to bring goodness into the world. Um, it's been such a blessing having you here. Um, and I'm, I'm glad this is the beginning of a long time relationship. We'll always be here for you. Thank and, you so much. Yeah. It's been such an incredible experience, you know, coming here to San Francisco the first time and meeting Mahogany and seeing yeah, the church exactly. and getting the story of the, you know, the, the, the history of the church. And the more I'm here and the more I'm just like, wow, this was, this is one of those signs of hope and one of those signs of things that are meant to be that really, you know, will fuel me for the, 
uh, to make make yeah, more for the next projects more. completely. And, and in all of our lives, that's we'll find these we'll find these like, moments of that will keep us going. Yeah, that's you know? exactly right. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is a big one. This is a big definitely. Well, I hope you all go upstairs and, and get a chance to see the um, image. Um, there's so many people yesterday said, you know, when I went to see the Mona Lisa, I was so disappointed, and when I saw this, I was just just amazing. <laughs> so um, go and, and see it. It's in the south transept, so directly above us. Um, and immediately after that, we will have the um, 11 o'clock service. You're welcome to join us. Everyone's welcome to receive communion at Grace Cathedral too. Um, we're going to be taking a break from the forum for the next couple of weeks as we prepare for Easter, but on April 16th, my guest will be Rhonda McGee. Dr. McGee is a professor of the law school at the University of San Francisco. She's an internationally known mindfulness teacher and practice innovator with a focus on applying mindfulness to the hardest challenges of our times. I can't wait to talk to her. She's um, an extraordinary person. So you're welcome um, to join us and um, support us on the forum. Um, gifts of any size make a difference. You can give in many different ways, including at gracecathedral.org. And again, David, thank you so much for thank bringing you. your life into the world. Thank you so much.